So let's go through um, some facts, and then we'll get into the back and forth. In the Constitution, Jay Hammond used to always remind me and go out to coffee with him, our duty is to maximize the benefit of our resources for the people of the state of Alaska, because you own the oil. We have to maximize production and the benefit to the people of the state of Alaska. Uh, next slide. Until 2006, um, we had a system called the ELF. The ELF was written in a way where unless you had a blockbuster field like Prudhoe Bay or Kapark, you were going to pay close to a 0% production tax. 15 of the 19 fields on the North Slope at that point paid a 0% production tax or less than 1%. You'd think that would be great under the governor's philosophy, we'll reduce taxes and they will come. Well, with a promise of a close to 0% production tax, next slide. And by the way, with a 0% production tax, even if you were making tons of money, even if oil was $100 a barrel, it was a 0% production tax on almost every field on the North Slope and any new field. Uh, next slide. Let's skip to the next one. What was happening with that 0% production tax and the promise to companies that unless you find some blockbuster field, any other field you're going to find is going to pay close to zero? Production was declining uh, in the four years before 2007 at a rate of about 8% a year, at a rate of about 5% a year before that. So were companies coming here increasing production with the promise of a tax where they're going to pay zero? I mean, there's the royalty too, Bruce and I will talk about that, but we're all talking about the production tax here. They didn't come. Next slide. Prices were jumping back starting around 2003. I mean, we lived in a world of $18 barrel oil forever. Prices started jumping in 2003. Uh, by 2004, they were close to $60 a barrel, and they kept going up. Zero production tax increasing oil prices, declining oil production. Just lowering taxes doesn't work. You have to be smarter than that. You have to require that companies give you something in exchange for your tax breaks. Just handing them a check and saying, we hope you'll reinvest here, but you don't have to. You can take the money to Texas. You can take the money to London. You could do that if you want. That is poor policy. And that's what happened under the old ELF. Um, the numbers, were, we don't debate, if we go back to Bruce's slide, we don't. Over the next five years, uh, when the bill really takes effect in FY13, starting in those five years, we'll lose about $1.8 billion a year under the governor's tax, which will impose somewhere between a 15 and a 25% tax. Right now, it's a 25% tax on profits. If you don't make money, we don't impose the production tax on you. And uh, go to the next slide. There we are. Uh, the green line is where we are now. We charge, you know, at let's say $90 a barrel. Our tax is somewhere in the 25 to 30% range. You've heard these stories that we have a 90% tax. So those are fake. They use this term marginal tax increase. I can't even explain it. But the tax that the companies actually pay, pay under the production tax is closer to 35% or so. Uh, the governor would drop that uh, quite substantially. Governor Purnell originally said his bill would lead to new exploration. Next slide. Well, so I tested that. In the Finance Committee, I asked uh, Exxon Conoco and BP, if the governor's bill passes, will we get more exploration? And when we talk about exploration, that's in new areas, not inside the fields where they're already drilling. So I asked Dale Pittman of Exxon, and uh, I asked him how many exploration wells they've drilled in the last 10, 20 years. He said, none. I said, if the governor's bill passes, are you going to increase your exploration activity? He said, no. That company is going to get a big share of that $1.8 billion a year in tax breaks, and they're not going to do any new exploration. How smart is that? I asked the same questions to the representative from BP. Uh, and uh, she said, if your question is, are we intended to do, intending to do more exploration? No. Those are two of the big three on the North Slope. Conoco said, maybe, maybe not. We're not committing to doing any new exploration in new areas. The three biggest companies in the state are going to do 
at least they haven't committed to and probably aren't going to do any new exploration on the, in, in this state if we pass this bill. How smart is that? I mean, is there not a better approach to getting what we want? They've called ACEs oppressive. You heard that word today. So let me just show you Conoco's uh, net income. It's averaged about $1.8 billion a year in the state since we passed ACEs. Uh, we're normally, um, uh, often they earn more in profit in Alaska than they do in the total over 48 combined. Uh, there was a year where they lost money worldwide, but they made money here uh, when Venezuela confiscated all their property. Um, they operate in pretty risky places. We don't confiscate property here. We don't kill workers. We don't have revolutions. Alaska is a, a very safe place to do business. And so when Conoco says they're being treated oppressively by only being able to earn $7.5 billion in profits under a tax system, you have to ask yourself what that means. British Petroleum, uh, about $8.2 billion in profits uh, over the first four years of ACEs. Um, we got this from a British report. The British report um, in, in uh, 2010 let them deduct $1.5 billion from their tax amount for their Gulf-related spill activities. I don't know the rules on that British report, but if you don't let them take out the Gulf-related spill costs, they took in about $2.2 billion in taxes uh, last year. Um, Exxon doesn't tell us what their profits are. They never do. They always withhold that information. But they say, just assume we make about what Conoco and BP do. We have, because we passed ACEs, probably one of the most stable financial systems in the country right now. We have $14 billion in savings. We built those savings, the bulk of them, because we passed ACEs. That's why we can fund the university. That's why we're not laying off teachers in this state. That's why we're not throwing construction workers out of work in this state. That's why we have money to try and help the state move forward and prosper. We also paid back a debt we owed to the Constitutional Budget Reserve, our savings account, um, and that was about a $5.5 billion debt. We did that with money we raised through ACEs. Let's take two fibs off the table. You'll see on TV the green ads from Make Alaska Competitive that we're losing jobs. Um, jobs are uh, higher now than they've been at any time uh, uh, in recent memory. Uh, roughly 13,700 people will be working on the North Slope or were uh, this, this September. That's an estimate from the Department of Labor. Um, you heard Mr. Tangerman say uh, that those jobs had to do with maintenance of the pipeline. Um, well, let me show you a slide the Parnell administration showed us in the legislature a year ago before he wanted this oil tax change. It said CapEx is capital expenditures, OpEx is operating expenditures. The majority of the growth in capital expenditures since 2007 is attributable to drilling, seismic, and other related projects, not maintenance. And what about operating expenses? Um, the expenditures related to major repairs does not appear to be the key driver in the growth of total operating expenditures. That's from the Parnell administration, before they wanted their bill passed. Now they want their bill passed and they're saying, it's all these jobs they have to do with maintenance of the pipeline. That's not what they told us before they wanted the tax change. Uh, in 2009, before the governor wanted his tax change, uh, he said he met with 10 oil company representatives. Four to five thought our tax system was just fine. Two or three thanked the state for the investment incentives that we provide, which are very substantial. Two companies said they wanted to see ACEs changed. Um, we've heard this uh, gloom and doom that the pipeline's about to shut down. Uh, when the companies come to us and they want a tax change, they'll make you think it's about to happen tomorrow. But uh, when they have to prove things up uh, in uh, legal forums um, and to their shareholders who they have to tell the truth to, uh, BP said to the SEC they expect the pipeline to go till 2065 uh, in a recent uh, litigation uh, they, it was found that the pipeline is likely to go until 2042. Um, we still want to reverse the production decline, but the scare tactics that the pipeline is about to shut down, that's political. That's not true. What did the governor's uh, budget director say last year 
uh, in, uh, in 2011. The good news is we're seeing a lot of increase in oil exploration. That's a good thing. Um, the Department of Natural Resources puts out a booklet on ACES uh, that says Alaska is successfully encouraging investment, bringing new companies to the state. Um, and uh, it's a positive brochure that doesn't include the negative things that all of a sudden we're starting to hear out of the same administration that put together the brochure saying things are working under ACES. Um, we are slated to have the most uh, active exploration season on the North Slope in 20 years. Uh, we're not positive, we won't know till the exploration drill uh, wells are drilled, but our Repsol says, and they said they bought leases before the governor proposed his plan, and they announced before the governor proposed his plan that they were going to spend roughly $800 million in uh, production related uh, or exploration related work on the North Slope. That's the biggest Spanish oil company. Um, and they said the North Slope of Alaska is an especially promising area for Repsol as it's already shown to be oil rich and carries low exploratory risk. Um, what other things are happening on the North Slope? NPRA. Conoco announced two years ago that they have development plans in NPRA. The only thing that's stopping them is an Army Corps of Engineers decision to block a bridge they need to build to get in there. But they have announced under the current tax system that they're going to start developing an NPRA. And I've worked to try and get that bridge decision reversed because they do need that bridge to get across the Colville River. Um, Great Bear has announced that they're going to start trying to do uh, shale oil drilling on the North Slope. Link Energy has announced uh, plans uh, to explore the North Slope, as have, has Brooks Range Petroleum and Ultrastar. These are companies that will explore this year or next year, uh, we hope. But um, if, if a good portion of those promises come true, we'll have the busiest exploration season on the North Slope in 20 years. Let's talk about how um, ACES works, because there's the difference between the myth and the reality. We passed this bill because it was flexible. It imposes a 25% tax only once you start making profits. Until then, you don't pay anything under the production tax. And then we say it's a 25% tax, but when you guys start making windfall profits at $100 a barrel oil, we want to share that. We're the sovereign, we own the oil here. And most countries around the world take a big share uh, for their oil because they also own it. Um, so we say you, it's a 25% tax on profits. Then we'll give you $30 worth of profit on that barrel of oil, and it'll still be a 25% tax rate. And then after you've made $30 of profit, of clear profit on that oil, um, then the surcharge uh, gets imposed, and we start increasing the tax a little bit. So it's 25% once you start making profits. For the next $30 of profit that you make, it's still 25%, and then it slightly goes up. So let me give you an example. Um, if an easy field like Prudhoe Bay is out there, it costs you $20 or $30 a barrel to produce, let's just say $20, you pay a 25% rate until oil reaches $50 a barrel, and then the surcharge kicks in, and the state starts sharing in the windfall profits. If you have a very difficult field to produce, we charge you a lower tax rate. Let's say it costs you $80 a barrel to produce that oil. Well, at $80 a barrel, we'll start charging you a 25% tax. But your rate doesn't go up until oil hits $110 a barrel. The harder it is to develop your oil, the more challenging the field is, the less your taxes. It's a lower tax rate on harder to develop fields. Um, you, you hear this 90% number. Um, uh, that relates to our tax rate. I'll let somebody explain what they really mean by that. Nobody pays a 90% tax in the state of Alaska. Um, the average, according to the Parnell administration, in the four years since PPT um, uh, has been about 32%. Uh, Mr. Tangeman talked about how unstable our taxes are. Well, we're going to change them again? I mean, the, the oil industry says Alaska has been a very unstable place because you keep changing your law. Murkowski changed it twice. He uh, did one technical change. And then he adopted the PPT law, which um, we then found out involved uh, offers of bribes from Bill Allen and Vico. And, and the bribery scandal said, hey, 
that said to us, we should go back and take a look at that law. So we changed it. I mean, we shouldn't be criticized for going back and changing a law that was tainted with corruption. That's what we had to do. So we changed it in 2007. That was not punitive. That was expected. But now the Parnell administration wants to change it again. So if they say that instability is a deterrent to investment in Alaska, they are deterring investment in the state of Alaska. We can't keep telling companies, hey, hold off on your development because next year we're going to have a law that's, that saves you even more money. Because that's the message they're sending. Hold off on your development. We think we can get a law passed. And then wait and then invest later. That is not good for business. Um, and it is not good for business to keep changing your tax laws every single year. We can do better um, than what the governor proposes. Um, the governor's proposal lets companies take roughly $1.8 billion a year and just keep it and send it to their shareholders and send it to their executives. I've offered a different proposal. Um, I've offered to increase the exploration tax credit. You can buy your tax rate down if you do things in the state of Alaska that produce jobs, produce exploration, and hopefully produce oil. But if you're not going to do that, you're not going to get a tax break. We're not giving you a blank check on a hope, wing, and a prayer that you're going to give the money back to us somehow. I mean, that doesn't really work very well with the Exxons of the world. Um, I've offered a credit for companies to do the most important thing on the North Slope. When a company finds a modest sized field on the North Slope, it's very difficult to bring online because then they have to build a processing facility that separates the oil from the water from the gas. And sometimes that's the deal breaker. And so I've offered a 50% tax credit if you build a processing facility on the North Slope to put new oil in the pipeline. Because we know you're only going to build that processing facility if we're about to get new oil. So we'll let you buy down your tax rate if you do things that put new oil in the pipeline, if you do things that give Alaskans jobs, if you do things that increase investment. But we're not just giving you a blank check. That's the difference between the proposal the governor has and our proposal. Um, there are two kinds of wells on the North Slope. There are development wells in the existing fields. And you want companies to keep pushing to get as much oil as possible out of those existing fields. Um, development wells are at the highest level they've been since 2006. We've already talked about this. How do our taxes compare to other places? Because you've heard this myth that Alaska somehow is confiscatory, when in fact there are other countries in the world that tax way higher than we do. Um, Chevron produced this. Um, since oil prices started going up, countries around the world started increasing their tax rate. Um, and um, Chevron shows, or their, show, their chart shows that there are a lot of countries around the world that have a government take, and government take means the percentage of profit from oil, a government take of 75, 80%, 90% in Iraq, the government takes 98% of the profit, and large oil companies still work there. Um, we received information in a seminar that Bruce and I went to recently that showed a number of countries, we can explain why they're relevant, why they're not relevant, but there are tons of places that charge a government take that's roughly the same to Alaska's. When we combine our royalty and our tax and our uh, property tax um, uh, and a very small corporate tax the state has, our government take is about 78%. Norway, 79%. Iraq, 98%. Um, we're, somewhere, uh, um, we're somewhere in the middle. Um, and um, at high prices, we do charge a high tax, but oil companies are making very high prices profits at high, high prices. Um, there was uh, something that the Fraser Institute put out, and, um, um, and they listed the 12 places with the worst tax systems in the world. And uh, uh, the big three and Repsol have either all or some of them invested in those areas. Um, this is hard to see, but the administration started using this chart this year to push tax reform until they realized they were misreading it. Um, if you go to the Alaska line, 40% uh, of uh, people they, that were polled uh, said that Alaska's tax law encourages investment. 
34% said it's not a deterrent to investment. So 74% of those uh, surveyed um, said that Alaska was not a place that was deterring investment, and in fact, or many of those said we were encouraging investment. Um, the administration had misread that slide to say that a majority of people, or roughly 50%, said we were uncompetitive, and when they realized that this is what it said, uh, that slide disappeared from their presentations. Uh, both operating and capital spending have gone up uh, since ACES has passed, um, and uh, and it's just a it's just a fact. Operating expenditures um, uh, in FY in, in the last fiscal year were up to about 2.2 billion dollars. Capital expenditures up to about 2.3 billion dollars. The estimates from the state are that capital expenditures and operating expenditures are expected to go up. Um, Mr. Tangerman said this year they went down. That's the first time I've heard that. Um, but they've generally gone up under ACES. Let's skip this one. Uh, more companies are doing business in Alaska since ACES has passed than they were before. In 2006, we had 19 companies doing business here. Uh, and uh, now we have 39 companies doing business here because we offer such generous tax credits for companies that want to explore and develop. We actually offer you a tax credit if you come here, you f lose money and don't find anything. We still help you pay for the loss. It's our way of attracting you to the state of Alaska. The North Dakota example, this is, um, I'm almost at the end. The TV ads act as if you can stop somebody from having a boom. I mean, there, there's a boom in North Dakota. We can't stop that. We can't take away their oil. Um, and the reason why, uh, and the oil's been there, and they've known the oil's been there for 50 years. And the reason why, and, and they've had low taxes for 50 years. The reason they're developing in North Dakota is they finally came up with the technology to get the oil out of hard rock. Um, so uh, you've heard this uh, the stuff about uh, Alaskans moving to North Dakota. Well, guess what? Texans are moving to North Dakota too, and they have one of the lowest tax rates in the country. People from Wyoming are moving to North Dakota, and there's a huge gas boom in Wyoming. So this argument that uh, only Alaskans are going there, people are going there from places with very low oil taxes. And they're going there because the economy is overheated. And when the economy is overheated, you get wages that are just way beyond what you really deserve. Um, we had that here during the oil boom in Alaska, where people came up from Texas uh, and other places. Uh, we asked legislative research to take a look at, at, at this. Why the boom in North Dakota? Is it because they have lower taxes? And actually, their taxes aren't that low. We can talk about that later. Uh, but they are lower than Alaska. Alaska's by some modest degree, not a great degree. Uh, because on top of the tax, they actually have to pay the private landowners a lease and a royalty. Um, and uh, we don't do that here. Um, but uh, according to that legislative research report, um, the recent exploration and production was spawned by technological advances advancements in horizontal wheel dr drilling and in hydraulic fracturing. It was due to a technology breakthrough. The tax system had been there forever. Um, they've adjusted it some, but it's been there uh, forever. So what happens when we pass the governor's bill? Well, we hope, I guess, that Exxon and Conoco and BP don't give all the money that we give away to their shareholders. We hope they don't take it out of state, but Last time we had low taxes, they did take it out of state. And then you have to ask yourself how you're going to fund this state and how we're going to increase our savings. Um, so in conclusion, what I would say is as a sovereign, we have to act as smart as Exxon acts when they protect their shareholders. I have to act for my shareholders, which are my constituents, the way they would act. And you have to ask yourself, what would Exxon do if they were in our shoes? Would they just give money away and hope that it comes back to them? Or would they say, you're only getting a tax break if you explore, if you build processing facilities, if you increase your well investment? Um, and uh, I think the answer is, as a state, we have to make sure that we say you can have a tax break if you do work that leads to jobs and leads to production and leads to investment. But we're not going to give you a blank check. And we're not going to do hope, wing, and prayer legislation. Thank you.